trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. And today I've got to respond to all the questions I've gotten about how can we prepare for surgery? What do we tell our anesthesiologist? Here's what you need to know to tell your anesthesiologist if you're having surgery, especially if you're anxious or afraid or if you've maybe never had surgery before or even if you've had surgery many times before. And it's because all the anesthesia medications that we give in operating rooms like this one here, like the white stuff that I'm holding in my hand, causes our bodies to reveal all sorts of things about itself that we probably ordinarily never tell people. Like some of our secrets, our, whether there are things that we're embarrassed to tell other people or if it's our body revealing secrets about our mental health state, depression, anxiety, and so much more. But if you know what to tell your anesthesiologist before surgery, you can prevent that potentially anxiety provoking scenario here in the operating room from being an anxious one, turn it into being a healing one where you can heal your mind as much as your body during surgery. And also what I help my patients with in my ketamine infusion clinic where they can have the same experiences, psychedelic-like experiences with medical supervision to overcome all sorts of challenging mental health conditions based on everything that I'm gonna share with you right now. I see people coming in. Michelle, good to see you. So the first thing you should always tell your anesthesiologist and your doctors before surgery is any history of traumas. Now, a lot of people think, you know, but doc, I'm having knee surgery or shoulder surgery or maybe a hernia, appendix, gallbladder, whatever. When you go under anesthesia, it doesn't matter what you're having surgery for. You're gonna have a breathing tube, medications that are gonna change how your brain works, and whether it's toe surgery or heart surgery, you're still susceptible to the same vulnerabilities that anyone else is, regardless of the type of surgery. And that's why telling your anesthesiologist about histories of traumas, especially in medical settings, Maybe a loved one died in a hospital, had a bad medical reaction, had something that has caused a level of trauma in you. Well, that's gonna come out under anesthesia, not only because you're in an operating room, but also because these medications, like the propofol that I'm holding here, uh, I have another one here, starts with an F, uh, you can see it there, fentanyl, opioids, ketamine, I mean, there's, you know what, I'll just show you because there's so many of them and they all impact what happens to your brain when you're under anesthesia. All these medications here, um, got some local anesthetics like lidocaine, steroids, all sorts of medications. Some of them psychoactive, some of them less psychoactive, but they will cause you to do things and say things and cause your body to open up in ways that can be healing or can be hurtful. For example, re-triggering PTSD when you're under anesthesia or when you're coming out of anesthesia can lead to patients doing all sorts of harmful things to themselves, biting themselves, hitting themselves, scratching themselves, hitting other people, waking up with more pain after, more nausea, versus somebody who may have had a history of trauma has told their anesthesiologist about it so that they can feel more comfortable in this medical setting, trust the providers, trust the system, and use that psychedelic experience to potentially heal themselves, come out stronger, fewer chance of complications. I see a whole bunch of comments coming in. Let's see, uh, <laughs> Curtis, good to see you. Michelle, Brenda, Mary, uh, and Michelle again. Uh, Michelle is asking if all anesthesiologists understand what I'm saying. I think all anesthesiologists do but because of limitations in their practice settings, maybe they can't take the time to do these with patients. I don't, can't speak for everybody, but all I can say is that you as the patient, I want you to remember to discuss these with your doctor. Number two is any medications that you use, whether they be prescription medications or things that you're not taken by a prescription. And I mean things like marijuana, LSD, mushrooms, uh, cocaine, methamphetamines, these are all potent, some of them very dangerous medications that most of my patients don't tell me. You know what happens? When they're on the operating room table here, I find out the hard way that maybe they've been using a lot of marijuana or using other drugs that then cause them connected to the ventilator here to go haywire. And you know who suffers at the end? 
the patient suffers. I'm not blaming patients, guys. I'm not blaming any patients. But if you don't tell us what is in your system, what your brain is habituated to over days, weeks, or months of use, well, on the table, it's going to come out because your body can't hold secrets when medications like this guy here, the propofol, the white juice, cause it to open up in ways. The body keeps score, whether it's to traumas or to medications that are constantly affecting the homeostasis and the chemical balance of your brain in your body. So you got to tell us, please be honest with us. We don't want to find out the hard way. Um, as people are coming in, this is uh, <laughs> a live here because many patients were asking me or viewers um, were commenting saying, hey, I'm really nervous before surgery. Can you tell us what to tell our anesthesiologist so that it can be as much of a healing experience as possible? And that's what we're here to talk about. Um, joyful Bay Area Gardens. Hey, you're in the Bay Area. I love it. That's where I practice as well. Um, Brenda, good to see you. And Jody um, is... Jody had a complete hysterectomy. I hope it went well. Um, feel free to let us know if you have any questions about um, maybe what the anesthesia was like or if you want to share your experience with others. Jody, just leave a comment there. Number three, tell your anesthesiologist if you feel that your anxiety and fear would be relieved by holding someone's hand. I know it sounds so like basic and elementary, but the number of patients that I look at the monitor, right? I got them on life support monitors. When they feel empowered enough to ask to hold my hand or the nurse's hand or whoever they're comfortable asking, I see on the monitors their body relaxes. What more could you ask for? I'm not giving you more medications. There's no more side effects. You're just holding someone's hand. That basic human touch is far from cliche. It's so powerful, in fact, that I can see them just relax. And the more relaxed you are before you fall asleep, your body kind of, we believe, imprints it a little bit so you wake up with less anxiety and less of all those things that we're talking about earlier. The kicking, screaming, being delirious, emotional. I had a patient recently who was just so tense for all these different reasons, bit their tongue really hard. It didn't come off or anything and it's part of, you know, it can happen to anybody even if you fall asleep uh, relaxed, but probably someone who is so anxious and wound up before falling asleep, in my experience, they tend to wake up more wound up, aggressive, difficult to console, etc. Great. Uh, so many comments coming in. Caitlin says, I always hold a nurse's hand. It makes me feel so much better. Well, Caitlin Allen, you're not alone. And I want you to ask your anesthesiologist if you can do that, if you want to do it, don't be shy. Ask for a hand to hold. Catherine, can you do a one-handed intubation? No, I cannot do that. Maybe someone out there can. I can. <laughs> Why does your arm burn like fire when they put you to sleep? Tina Cook, it's because of this white medication here. Um, all right, all right, all right. Uh, can ants eat your brains, LOL? Sleepy G, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, and Joeful Bay Area Gardens. Yes, it was raining here. It was fantastic. I loved it too. Uh, okay. Hey, if you guys appreciate my time here after a long day in the operating room, um, do please hit that like button and share with others. Your, your support helps me do this more often and helps share this knowledge with other people. So remember, you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told, and that's why I'm sharing these. Uh, number five, or number four, <laughs> things to do if you're anxious before surgery and fearful. What to ask your anesthesiologist? Ask them to repeat positive affirmations before you fall asleep, while you're asleep, and while you're waking up. Once again, seems basic and elementary, right? So powerful. A study in Germany, multi-center, randomized controlled trial two years ago, showed that just repeating positive affirmations with earphones and patients on the operating room table here. Unconscious, they're connected to a ventilator. They got all the anesthesia gas here, turning their brain off as far as we know, but not turning it off enough to prevent positive affirmations from causing better pain scores after waking up, meaning waking up with less pain. Uh, can get out of the hospital more comfortably, faster. Don't be afraid to ask your anesthesiologist to give you positive vibes as they fall asleep. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to be viewed as like a hooey, like, you know, crunchy granola out there person. No, no. I encourage you to feel vulnerable and to 
engage with your anesthesiologist and ask for that because we are happy to do it. And the benefit for you might be profound because when you have these medications on board, remember your defense mechanisms are toned down. So if ordinarily I say, hey, Steve, take a big deep breath in and out. Know that you're safe and warm and loved for and everyone here is taking care of you. The awake Steve might be like, sounds kind of creepy that you're telling me that, right? <laughs> Even though it's not meant to be creepy, but the point is that they might brush it off. When you have your defense mechanisms and maybe maladaptive behaviors toned down from anesthesia in the vulnerable situation like you're in, in this operating room, remember all the medications I showed you earlier in here, right? These medications totally can lower defense mechanisms. Things like all of the beta blockers that we have in here, Esmolol, Labetalol, these things all fundamentally change our views. Uh, they change, I guess, our views. Not only the views, but also our body's physiology, things that would ordinarily make us feel like, that's lame, or make us feel anxious or nervous because they're getting into our comfort zone or pushing us out of our comfort zone. You can actually engage with those things with your anesthesiologist by having that communication with them with these medications on board. It's what I do in my ketamine infusion clinic once again, where when the defense mechanisms come down, there's some disassociation from the fears, the cognitively rigid patterns that my patients have been struggling with that might have been leading to their depression, anxiety, chronic pain, PTSD, et cetera. That's a valuable opportunity, a window to be able to help them overcome these challenges. And you can do the same if you ask your anesthesiologist to either repeat positive affirmations or just in a non-creepy way, whisper that, hey, you're the most important person in the world. You don't, you don't have to tell them to say that, but you can ask them to give you positive affirmations, positive energy. If a doctor looks at you funny for saying that, I'm sorry, I can't control what other doctors do, but certainly I will never, ever put down a patient's wish when they ask me for that. And I get asked that not too infrequently, but I would be asked it more if patients weren't anxious or afraid of asking. That's what I want you to do, to be empowered and not be ashamed of ever asking. Uh, and then the last and probably most important thing is that you should ask your anesthesiologist before surgery to help reduce your anxiety and fear is to seriously ask them if you can chat with them before your surgery. In almost any walk of life, whether you're in an operating room, you're about to give a speech, doing an athletic uh, performance, whatever, when you have expectations, you can prepare. When we don't have expectations, it's hard for us to prepare. And the less prepared we are, the less certain we feel, the less confident we feel. And you know what fuels anxiety and fear and phobias and is fuel for chronic pain to develop after surgery? Fears, uncertainties, doubts about what to expect. So what I always recommend is that patients reach out and ask to have an anesthesiologist call them so that they can get their questions answered so they can know what to prepare. Might sound basic, but when I do this with my patients, I call them the night before. I don't even wait for them to ask me. I go out and I do it for them. I call them and if they pick up, because they often think I'm a telemarketer or something and it's really annoying because they, you know, stop calling me and they hang up and then I'm gonna send them a text or a voicemail be like, hey, I'm actually your doctor. I'm gonna be your anesthesiologist tomorrow. And then they apologize, it's always the same thing. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, doctor. I thought you were one of these annoying telemarketers. But <laughs> once we get past that, you can hear the transformation in their voices, not in everybody, right? Some people have fantastic coping mechanisms and maybe all of these don't apply to them. But for the majority of my patients, the benefit is more than any medication could do for them. I'll give them midazolam and I'll give them, you know, opioids, and all those things in the operating room, but they can't take them home. So that's why the more confident you can have within yourself without medications giving you that temporary relief from uncertainties and fears, the more you can inspire that within yourself from the help of your trusted doctor, the better off you're gonna be in surgery and the more relaxed your body will be when you trust the anesthesiologist that you spoke with before you put your life in their hands. 
call me crazy, but if you know whose life or who's going to be holding your hand in the scariest moment of your life, you'll probably feel more comfortable with them versus just meeting them on the morning of. All right, let's catch up with questions here. Um, Chris, good to see you. Um, Tina, good to see you as well. Uh, and Catherine, all right, all right. Joyful is having some pretty bad stress fracture pain, worried about surgery uh, and the pain in the tibia. Yeah, well, Joyful, I'm sorry that you're having these stress, fact, stress fracture pains. Should surgery be needed? Just so you know, our stress levels probably play a role in our wound healing long term, especially if that stress leads to things like depression, and we know that depression can lead to poor nutrition and inflammation and things that probably can not, probably won't provide the best bone healing environment or other wound healing environment. Just goes to show the power of the mind and body. So if you have these fears, I certainly encourage you to talk with your doctor about everything that we're talking about today. So that should surgery ever be needed, hopefully it won't be, your mindset isn't a place that won't set you up for a post-operative depression where you might have malnutrition that might cause the bones not to heal properly, etc. These things are all connected and it's not by accident that post-operative depression is a real thing. And that's not the time in your life when you want to be depressed when you're trying to help your body heal, put it in the best peak condition for healing. Um, Catherine had propranolol guided therapy today. Wow, Catherine, thank you for sharing that. I actually wanna show you the medications that I use here for similar things. And if you're comfortable sharing, Catherine, how did that go? Uh, Catherine's talking about using beta blockers like this guy here. Esmolol is one, labetalol is another. And she's talking specifically about propranolol. You can hear the same difference, the same name, right? Anol, labetalol, metoprolol, atenolol. Propranolol is different because it is more uh, fat soluble. It crosses the blood brain barrier. We believe that's why it might be more effective for exposure therapies um, and reconsolidating traumatic memories to prevent them from continuing to be PTSD. Catherine, if you're comfortable sharing, I'd love to know how that went for you today. Uh, EV Adventure Rob. Hey, I saw your comments earlier and I actually really appreciated them. They were very thoughtful. And what you're saying now, where there's uncertainty, there's anxiety, is 100% correct. That's why we're in an operating room today, so that you can hopefully break the uncertainties with knowledge and preparation of what happens to your body in this environment. Um, uh, Mary Fernandez teaches alternative and holistic therapies to new nurses and uh, would I, I'd be shocked to see how much they don't know and lead to not asking their patients. Yeah, Mary, I'm not shocked because I experience this as well. When we're afraid to talk about things, we typically don't talk about them, right? So I'm grateful that you are empowered enough to share those alternative, hopefully all evidence-based therapies with nurses that you train. Um, and just as a reminder, I'm a Sanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. And that's why I talk about the mind-body connection, even in an operating room like this one here, where we have powerful medications, ventilators that reveal what happens to the body or that reveal what your body has undergone in the past. Remember, the body opens up like a book, whether it's through a psychedelic experience, like with ketamine in my infusion clinic or here with white stuff, propofol, uh, opioids, I have uh, midazolam, other benzodiazepines, you name it. The body keeps score and it's all revealed under anesthesia. Uh, let us answer one last question here and then we'll break for the weekend. Teresa says, I have an appointment tomorrow. I talk about a celiac plexus block to confirm and test for neurogenic mouths. I'm going to be scared when the block is set up. Well, Teresa, I hope everyone here sends you some positive vibes. Uh, a certain amount of anxiety is totally normal. When we do nerve blocks, like when I do nerve blocks, the more anxious the patient is, in some studies, it looks like the efficacy of the nerve block is not as effective. Maybe because you're all cinched tight and we can't get the needle in the right place um, or not in the ideal place. Maybe for other mind-body reasons, we don't know. But I hope that you feel confident about getting the celiac plexus block, in this case, the test block. And the more confidence you have, like Rob was saying earlier, confidence and certainty go together. 
They are the antidotes, or at least some of the antidotes, to anxiety and fear. The more confidence you have, the more certain you are about what you're doing and why you're doing it, the less room there is for anxiety to invade your heart, mind, soul, body that ultimately torpedo your therapy, or in this case, the nerve block. So I hope that you've gained a little bit more inspiration and confidence to advocate for yourself so that you crush your nerve block. I hope it works well. And I hope that maybe a future celiac plexus block will help put that pain all together to help you live your life the way you want. Um, oh, and I guess one more question here. Jake is asking any tips for being an anesthetist. Um, to become a CAA. I don't know what a CAA is though, Jake. Sorry, I, I don't have any tips because I don't know what a CAA is. I know what an AA is, is that what you mean? But we can talk about it next time. I hope everyone learned, uh, <laughs> I hope everyone learned something and is more empowered to take control of their health because you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told. Whether you're in a scary operating room like this one, hopefully not so scary anymore, and with a not so scary anesthesiologist, I hope, on a table like this, ventilator, no ventilator, doesn't matter. You have power that you've probably never been told about, and that's what I hope you all take away. I'll see you on the next live. Um, if you did learn something, I'd appreciate it if you hit that like button and share with others so you can also inspire others to take more control over their health. Till next time.